Hello everyone, welcome to this month's Mother of All Demo Days meeting. Today we're going to have three demos from Bedrock, uh, Compute Over Data, and Consensus Lab. And for those that are new here or haven't attended in a while, once every month the Starfleet teams get together to share progress in their projects in the format of a demo. Um, so hence Mother of All Demo Days. But first up, we have a DVD presenting from Bedrock. Hi everyone, I'm David Drujanski. I'm an engineering manager on Bedrock. This is kind of a meta demo. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting um, about the value of dog fooding and have a group exercise uh, for the second half. Uh, but the goal here is to really explain what dog fooding is, uh, um, why it's valuable, how to do it. Um, it may not always be as straightforward on some of the different teams here at Protocol Labs, and then how we do it on Bedrock specifically. Um, and hopefully at the end of this, you'll understand the, the value of dog fooding and think about ways of how to apply it to your team. So with that, what is dog fooding? Uh, so a dog fooding is the process of regularly using your product, um, otherwise known as eating your own dog food and experiencing it as a real user. Um, and I, I put product here because it doesn't just have to be software. People have done this for hardware products, for physical objects. Um, and But obviously at Protocol Labs, we focus on the software, so we'll uh, lean into those types of examples. So why is this valuable? Um, really the goal here is to build user empathy. And by that, um, by doing that, we can actually build a better product. And you'll actually be quite surprised by the number of insights that you learn about and realize as you step into the role of a user, taking off that developer hat, that engineering hat, and just using the product, uh, you'll start to see it in a different way. And uh, we found that um, at least within Bedrock and historically, like you dog food, you'll figure out, hey, this bug is really annoying. Uh, I should fix it right away. Or um, you'll just have a better understanding of the overall product itself. Oh, this is what this feature does. This is why it's useful. Um, on Bedrock, we have a bunch of different teams um, working on different areas of the tech stack. And so by having different uh, dog fooding tasks, we actually get exposure to other parts of the system and learn how uh, that part of uh, the code base works. Uh, so it also gives a lot of technical um, kind of like knowledge sharing by just using different parts of the system, uh, get you more familiar with it. Uh, but ultimately it increases what I call the, the feedback loop of this development cycle of just iterating on using the product regularly, getting feedback regularly, you're gonna improve it that much faster. How do you actually dog food? Uh, so the ideal way is to use a piece of software on a regular basis. Um, now, uh, the prime example and what really got dog fooding popular it was uh, Google. Um, they use this in almost all of their software products. Uh, and you can imagine for their search product, their, their biggest one, right? Like you use search every day. If you don't come up with the result that you're looking for, uh, you send that off to the team and they make improvements. And the key here is like you have a list of users that's willing to uh, to deal with bugs and to deal with like not yet production grade software so that you get that feedback uh, regularly. Maybe my favorite example is uh, from Apple. Uh, so like when they were uh, designing the iPhone, what they actually did, the design team uh, for their version of dog fooding, they actually carved blocks of wood and would carry it in their pocket uh, to simulate the experience of having a device with you at all times and like build a better product that way. That's maybe an extreme version of dog booting on the design side, but it shows that you know you don't even have to have a fully functioning product to be actually uh, tested out and see what it actually is like to experience that product itself. So that's the ideal. Like you could use a product every day. Now at uh, PL, um, not all of our products. Um, at least not yet are used every day. And so how do we kind of like simulate that experience or get that uh, feedback uh, sooner? Uh, so on Bedrock, what we do is we actually have a team rotation. Uh, so we have three teams on Bedrock. One team every for every team meeting will create a task that everyone has to complete ahead of time. Uh, and that task is time boxed to 10 minutes. And everyone on the team, it doesn't matter if you're an engineer or a product manager, will attempt to complete that task. And then at that meeting, we'll come, we'll discuss how it went. Uh, uh, we'll generate all the feedback, collect it, and the team can use that going forward to improve their product. Now, the keys here are that the tasks are simple. 
uh, both for creating them um, and also for attempting them um, so that anyone can do it. Again, it doesn't matter if you're an engineer and you know how the code works or you just want to use it uh, as a TPM, for example. Um, it has to be easy to provide feedback. And maybe the most important thing here is that failure is okay. And what do I mean by that is like, if the user can't finish the task, uh, th that is a problem, not with the user, but with the software most likely. And so like getting into that mindset, like we expect this to fail and it's okay if it fails, that's really valuable feedback for the team. That means it wasn't easy enough or the software was not good enough uh, to perform that task uh, from the user. Uh, and so that's actually expected. And that's, uh, I think, a good mindset to have when you're dogfooding th these uh, versions of software as we develop them uh, live. Uh, so this is kind of like a visual map of how that works. Again, we have three teams on, on Bedrock. We rotate them. One team will create a task. Everyone on the team spends 10 minutes sometime throughout the week. And then uh, they try to complete that task. We talk in the meeting how it went. We provide that feedback to the team, and then it rotates. So that's kind of how we do it. Okay, so we're going to try a really quick group exercise here. Um, on the right is a template that we use on Bedrock for like creating a task. Uh, so you you know you name the task. This is actually a copy of the latest uh, dog fooding task we did on the team. Uh, and I, you know the demo day edition. Uh, you know when do we want people to complete it by? Who made it? Um, and then the task details. And you can see that these are pretty straightforward, simple details. Um, you know, again, 10 minutes, uh, but the goal here, just to run through it, uh, we're going to use this product that we've built on bedrock, the tornado team, it's called Lassie. Uh, it, its goal as a product is that you give it a CID and it gets the content and the key distinguishing factors, like it doesn't matter if it's on a Filecoin node or an IPFS node, it'll just do its best, uh, to find that, uh, content. And we're going to run the, the HTTP server, uh, from Lassie. Um, so that we can um, test out the HTTP API there and making sure that we can get content like we would any other HTTP server. And this is actually used in the Rhea project with Saturn. So uh, that's why we dogfooded it earlier. Uh, and then I've also listed uh, a few CIDs here uh, and that we're going to try getting those specific CIDs and see how it goes. Now, because of time, I'm probably just going to run through this really quickly, uh, but Essentially, uh, I'll go and install the latest version of Lassie. I already have it installed, so you're not going to see anything, but um, no new downloads, but it's there. And then we're going to just run the server. So again, I'm going to run in the top left corner here. Okay, the server is up. Awesome. It's on port 50, 50, 50. And now I'm going to attempt to get a CID. Uh, so this is a template. So I'm going to copy one of the CIDs from below. And I'm going to give it a name. It's, so it's easy. Let's call it CID1. And lastly, I'll put everything in a car file format. So I'm going to run that. Now, the cool thing you could see from the HTTP server the logs of how it requested, what provider it's actually getting it from, uh, which is pretty cool. And I'm, and just because we're here, and I and to make it a better demo, I'm going to do the same thing for the second one. Okay, this one a little bit more interesting. Um, it looked at a few more providers. Uh, you can like read through the logs if you're interested, uh, and it tells you the overall duration. If I look at my directory, I have two. Now the next step in the demo, uh, sorry, in the dog food task, it's to then view the file. So I'm going to go ahead and just view the car file. So I'm going to try uh, did one. Okay. That's kind of like a blob. Interesting. And then uh, I'm going to look at the second one as well. Uh, oops. Okay, that one actually is a text file, uh, so it's a little bit easier to parse. Um, I don't have time right now, but the first one is actually like a PNG image on IPFS. This one is uh, an XML feed for a blog. Um, but that's it. Uh, so then afterwards, I could leave feedback um, below. This is how we do like some lightweight feedback. And then ultimately, the team would then 
either the user or the team could file these as GitHub issues. Um, and then we can like kind of start to prioritize them in the backlog after talking about it. And here's something that um, you know, some example feedback of what I wrote previously. Uh, and you can see what the other team has wrote. Like Jacob actually figured out how to open that um, that blob uh, more easily. Um, and it's basically requires some like car expertise, um, the Go car library to use it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an example uh, of how we dog food. Uh, let me just, uh, I think that's about it. I think the only other thing is, uh, again, think of how you can dog food um, on your team. It, it doesn't have to be every day, but if you can do something like a rotation, um, I think it'll bring a lot of value to uh, the software you build and happy to help you do that as well. If you're stuck or you're not quite sure how to set it up, um, feel free to use our templates that are linked on the presentation. And uh, we can also jump into a chat sometime and um, I can help out or anyone on the team as well. Uh, so thanks. Thanks so much for sharing, DVD. Now, up next, we have Wes. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Wes Floyd. I'm a product manager on the Back of Yow team, and I'm presenting new project Water Lily on behalf of a much broader team. Ali Hare is one of our project leads. Uh, Simon. Uh, from our team has been doing a lot of development. Kai, Luke, uh, Irina, is, our team is helping. It's it's really, I guess, a lot of the back of y'all team was also participating, but I just want to call out there's a, a lot more folks that are doing the work. I happen to be on the, the best time zone for this session, so <laughs> I've got to take you through the content. So I'm going to take you through three components here. First, we're going to talk a little bit about how back of y'all fits in with FEM, a, a brief refresher. Then we're going to talk about LilyPad, which is an important new component we've built between FEM and back of y'all sort of a bridge. And then I'll spend most of the time talking about ethical art, AI generated art, and a really interesting novel approach. I think this is one of the first projects to ever do, which is compensating artists, not for their work on chain through an NFT, but through derivative styles of their work on chain. Uh, so it's a fun use case and we'll jump right in. So for a little bit of, uh, of promo here, background uh backer yao is sort of almost like an l2 on top of the filecoin chain you know filecoin chain fevm is where a lot of our coordination work happens backer yao is an off-chain compute ecosystem you can find out information about, about it at backeryao.org uh, to see more about the architecture and effectively it can run any sort of compute that can be containerized in a docker container or wasm binary uh, in a batch mode across the network of backer yao machines. So really trying to get the best of both worlds, the trust and verifiability of on-chain uh, with the verifiability of these new off-chain compute systems, but more robust, complicated workloads like, in this case, uh, ML model inference for generating art. Project LilyPad is the bridge between layer one and layer two. Uh, so LilyPad is effectively, uh, it's two components. One, it's a smart contract on Falcon virtual machine. It's listening for events. People might want to invoke a back of the job, so it's listening for them to invoke those jobs. And then secondly, it's an off-chain daemon that is um, uh, listening for events that are triggered through the LilyPad events call or smart contract, and then actually triggering those back of the out jobs. So it's a bit of a, of a bridge at this point. I'm not going to use the word duct tape. Uh, I'm going to use the word bridge. Uh, so anyways, please find out more about LilyPad here at the website, GitHub. Here you can see the source code. This is a component that we will potentially open up to more broad use cases. We'll talk in a minute at the end about other applications of this technology. So if you're thinking about scenarios where you have on-chain workloads, smart contracts that are you know very smart contract intensive, but it could benefit and have more robust capability if it could do off-chain compute, or if you're already using that off-chain compute today in AWS or GCP, but if, if that compute were now more uh, trustless, verifiable, and open, those are exactly the types of use cases that we want to help you with. This is a demo from Ali's machine of actually invoking the LilyPad uh, caller solidity contracts. Uh, and in our GitHub repo, you'll see lots of examples of how to build your own here. But eventually, it enables a user to pay for a job using fill or tfill if you're on testnet, specify as a string input the spec of the off-chain job they want to run, what's a Docker container name, what, what specific uh, code do you want to run. And then uh, it invokes it, it sends it on chain. And then this is an example here. The uh, the, the previous, oops, hold on a second. The previous uh, examples that we use this for was just generating stable diffusion images. And let me do this here. This is an example of saying, we're gonna run a standard stable diffusion image. Stable diffusion, by the way, 
it, for folks that are not into machine learning is a, is a framework for generating arc. So we give it a text prompt and we say, generate uh, unicorns and rainbows. And the AI can magically create that art. No human had to draw this. Um, so it's very powerful stuff. Uh, but what's interesting and people have talked about in the past is to say, well, what if I wanted to generate that, but generate it in the style of Van Gogh or generate it in the style of Pablo Picasso? This style transfer thing is another layer on top of stable diffusion. That's a really fun application of the two technologies combined. So this is what we were working on in the past. And you can see some examples of how the AI will automatically generate different combinations. It's all random each time. It's all unique of, uh, of this AI-generated art. So the next thing that we did on top of this was to build Water Lily. And the goal here is to say there's a lot of underrepresented artists, a lot of opportunity for them to better monetize their work. So instead of actually taking their work and selling that work on chain, what if we could train their style? So if there was a new artist in the space, let's say her name was Misty. And Misty's got a tremendous amount of work. She's got 40 or 50 different art, uh, pieces in her collection. And we're not going to, to do any work with her copyrighted work. We're just going to generate a style. It's, a, it's an ML model effectively that represents her style. And so when I generate rainbow unicorns, I want to generate it in Misty's style specifically. And I also want a portion or all of the payments to go to Misty. This is the impetus behind uh, Water Lily, and it's a great way to bring together all these different concepts uh, into one place with a, with a nice sort of humanitarian uh, uh, output. So we are going to be launching this uh, project soon, the next few days. You'll see some more information about it if you visit waterlily.ai. We're still working a few bugs out. We're still growing the number of artists that we have on the page here, but I want to give you guys just a little bit of grounding of what it's going to look like. This is a couple of fun examples from our internal testing of, of what it looks like when you apply this style transfer to generated art. So we found in the public domain, this was an artist from the 1800s who had performed lots of drawing of Native Americans and English settlers and things like that. And so we gave it the text prompt, generate uh, a picture of Barack Obama. So this is Barack Obama as if that artist from the 1800s had drawn Barack Obama, which he did not. Uh, generated image of Captain America. This is all, again, generated images. Uh, and in this case, after the, the work comes back from Bakr Yao, we will be sending the funds to the artists themselves um, for public domain. We'll probably donate to a, to a charity that, that aligns with Falcon Foundation's mission. Um, and then a couple other fun examples. We can even take things that are very messy, like these are stills from an artist who did a lot of noise-generated uh, art with music. We took the stills, we trained their style, and now we say generate rainbow unicorns. And this is actually rainbow-generated unicorns with that, that style applied. Um, some other examples here from a 1920s artist with some interesting illustrations. And now what, is, what does it look like as if that artist had generated Barack Obama? So lots of fun, fun things we can do there. We're really just scratching the surface. So in terms of what's next for this space, um, we're, we're going to be building on a couple of things. One, we're going to build on our partnerships in the decentralized science space. We've got some partners that were very interested in doing some uh, bioinformatics pipelines that generate NFTs. Um, and those NFTs, the backend work would go through Bakuyao. The NFTs would align well with their mission. So more, more to come on that. Um, and then we have some other partners that we're interested in doing, um, improving the ability to generate yield in decentralized finance. So rather than just having a smart contract to execute trades on your behalf, if you could have Bakuyao, which consumes large amounts of important information, clean information from IPFS and Filecoin, you could run more sophisticated models of how you want to buy and sell, exchange, create loan contracts within, within DeFi. So there's just lots of interesting areas when you're starting to combine the power of FEM, the power of off-chain compute. We're very excited about it. And then if anyone would like to get in touch with us, please reach out. We've got our GitHub information here for these various projects, Twitter accounts. Uh, I'm available in, in Filecoin Slack at West Floyd. Um, Ali, you can see here, um, developer Ali is uh, is the Twitter contact for Ali, who's running a lot of our project day to day basis. Thank you for the opportunity to to present. That's all I have, uh, and uh, we appreciate it. Awesome! Thanks so much, Wes. I can't wait to see what's next. So please come back and demo again. And last but not least, we have Alfonso. I'm Alfonso Larutza. I'm a research engineer at Protocol Labs, and at Consensus Lab, and what we're working on mainly and what we're focusing on is on IPC. And the idea behind IPC, many of you may, may be aware already, is to uh, scale horizontally the Filecoin blockchain. So try to run subnets that are able to interoperate with, uh, with Filecoin mainnet and uh, interact and anchor their security to them 
as a way of deploying new new applications that can have uh, more scalability and and new features. Last year we were focused on on like um, figuring out how we could do this, uh, have an MVP, and this is how it looked like, right? So we had Lotus, everything was a monolith, and running a subnet it was as nice, as easy as calling um, a command in Lotus, and it would run the subnet for you, and, and you could start interacting with with it. It was great because the user experience was great, but it had a lot of problems in terms of uh, once you want to move into production, because if a subnet failed, it was really hard to, like everything was handled with routines. In the end, it was a nightmare. So as we're moving into production, this is what um, what the architecture looks like. And what I'm going to show today, actually, I think I demoed it six months ago or eight months ago, but it was with this architecture. Now we're moving into the production architecture. I'm going to show how it will look like as we move into mainnet. And the idea is that we have a new piece of software. Instead of having everything in the same Lotus and like handling everything in the same Lotus, what we have now is that we have the different independent networks and subnets. So this root net could be uh, the Falcon mainnet, and we could have running or, or like the, the community could uh, run different subnets, and we have this piece of software that is called the is called the IPC agent, which is the one that is going to orchestrate all of the communication with the different blockchains. So instead of having to run a single Lotus that has to know how to interact with every blockchain, which has a limitation because once we start having like other technologies in these subnets, it's really hard to embed every consensus algorithm and every uh, single feature into Lotus. So we, in this way, we're decoupling the what we call replica. So the um, the um, running of the blockchains and the subnets from the IPC agents, which is our IPC client and the one that we use to um, use IPC over all of these networks. And um, so if someone wants to run a subnet in IPC uh, that is communicating with, with Falcon Manet, it wants to communicate with some L2 and it wants to run another, another L3, this is the architecture or the different processes that it would have to to run. So the IPC agent communicating to different nodes or peer implementations in, a, in each of these networks. So you see that this allows to, to more like uh, more decoupled architecture, but before we were all happy and young and it was just interacting with a single process. Now we have a lot of processes. We, there's a lot of overhead that we need to handle. Um, if you want to look at the code, before, uh, it was all Lotus. Everything was in, in our fork of Lotus that we call Eudico. Now, there are a bunch of, of other repos because we have the APC agent, that is this client that I'm going to show, that it's used to orchestrate the different uh, instances of subnets with which our applications wants to interact. Then we have the IPC actors because uh, with FVM before, everything was in the legacy VM of, of Lotus. Now, we, have, uh, we target the FVM. Actually, we are not targeting the FEVM. Everything is in Rust, but we're moving into Solidity, this contract, so that we can also be in user land with FEVM. But right now, what we're doing is we have a, a custom bundle in our subnets that include our uh, FVM actors compiled to Wasm. So if you want to have a look at the actors that run all of the on-chain logic for IPC, you can go to this repo. And finally, we have, of course, Eudico, which is our fork of Lotus that includes like a new consensus algorithm and does all of the heavy lifting of the blockchain side of things to run each of these different subnets. So it's the peer implementation for each of these subnets. And as I was saying, there's a lot more now than before. Before using IPC was easy. Now we're trying to improve the UX, but we are we are working on a lot of documentation, and it would be great if and like all of you can start testing this and give feedback. Uh, like DVD is perfect that you did that demo because we really need to do dog food this and figure out like the right UX for for this tech. And with that, I will jump into my. So yeah, as I was saying, like the main our main process for to interact with IPC is the IPC agent. So what I'm gonna do first is like run this um, my IPC agent. So now we're running the IPC agent. Again, it's a really uh, slim process that will do all of the the interaction with the different blockchains. What we need to do now is like we have nothing right now. IPC is not there, so we need to run some some root net and from there deploy a, a subnet. So the first thing that we're going to do is like, we have this convenient um, script to run um, a root net. So this is a really uh, a script that runs a, a single validator root net is for testing. Um, and it simulates what would be our interaction with the Falcon mainnet if we wanted to deploy a subnet 
um, over Falcon. This may take a while because under the hood, what, it, what this is doing is uh, deploying a, a Docker container, um, creating a, a Lotus daemon, and then running a mere validator. Because in, in our, so we're simulating here actually not the Falcon mainnet, but our SpaceNet testnet that runs the mere consensus. And the mere consensus in the end is a BFT uh, consensus that goes a bit faster. So it's, so our subnets ship with this consensus that is faster and has like, uh, you can go at any block time that you want, but we have it configured to go at one second block time. So uh, deploying an actor, deploying a smart contract should feel faster than how it feels now in, in Falcon Magnet. Yeah, I should have prepared some joke or something for the wait. In the meantime, let me share the other piece that, oh, okay, cool. So it was what's unexpected. Uh, so here you see that we deployed the, the root net and it gives us this script, a bunch of information that we need for our IPC agent to be able to interact with, with our, in this case, we only have a node in the root net, but we could have like more, a single node running like interacting with the Falcon mainnet or whatever other um, architecture we want. So here it says that uh, we're running in this uh, container. That's not important, but what it will be really important is what is our default wallet and what is the token to interact with our peer implementation in the root. And the reason for this is because we have to go to our IPC agent and tell them to what are the credentials to interact with the rootnet? In this case, I'm just going to interact with the rootnet. It's listening in this port, and I'm going to give. I'm going to give him the. So with this, our IPC agent now knows how to interact with the rootnet, and we can uh, create a new subnet. Uh, when we say this IPC agent creates subnet, actually, what we're doing is deploying what we call this subnet actor, which is the smart contract in the rootnet that will govern the operation of the subnet. So, hey, hello. Something failed. Uh, OK, this is probably because I didn't copy paste this correctly. OK, so I forgot to reload the config to notify with my next, what was my latest config. So sorry. Um, yeah, so now I, I, I'm going to be able to create the, should have done a, a cheat sheet for this. So yeah, I, once I get the token, I have to put it in my, in, my, in my config and reload the config. So now you see that we created this subnet actor that is going to govern the new subnet. And it says that we have a subnet, run, like a new subnet actor where we can run a subnet um, with ID root T0102. So now what we're going to do is actually run a node for that subnet. So join the subnet and, and run in that subnet. And I mean, we have also uh, this, uh, a convenient script to show how this works. But in order for you to see the logs and see what is happening under the hood, I'm going to run the node manually to show you how it works. So here I'm just running a Lotus daemon with, um, with the genesis of this new subnet. And what we're going to do now is initialize um, initialize the validator for the subnet. So we initialize the validator for the subnet. We import our wallet. And uh, you'll see that right now, if I try to run the validator, so actually, yeah, if I try to run the validator, it's going to fail. And the reason for this is that because I haven't joined the subnet. So um, my uh, node will interact with the parent, and we'll have to ask permission to this subnet actor that we um, that we just deployed to ask for permission to because like the parent is the one that runs the subnet. So what we need to do is to join the subnet in the parent. To do that, like we have to check. I mean, we have to announce what is our validator address. We take like any of these. Um, multi addresses for my validator. And now we're going to join the subnet. So from the APC agent, we say that we want to join this new subnet, that we want to put this amount of file as collateral, and that we want the we want other validators to find out in this. So we copy there. And once we've joined the subnet, where we're going to be able is that now the parent will have us registered as a valid validator of the subnet. And you see that when we try to uh, start running in this case, 
now we're part of the subnet and we, we have the rootnet where we're mining and also we have a new network here uh, subnet where we could be running any kind of application what happens if like again the, with the apt agent we can handle all the life cycle of our subnet we could deploy another subnet like for instance we could create here a new another subnet with a parent in the root and we'll have some other um, so the ID was in this case C01002 and I could run my own application and my own nodes for this for this subnet and I can also leave the subnet and if I leave the subnet what happens is that I take out my stake in the subnet so um, my so in here in the right in the bottom right where I'm mining once I leave the subnet, these validators should crash because like I no longer have rights to to mine in that subnet. So I leave the subnet and once these transactions go through and the state goes down, these validators should crash. And you see like it crashes because I no longer have uh, access rights to mine. So this is just the life cycle of a subnet. Sorry for the delay. I forgot completely about reloading the, the config. Uh, we also have convenient. So I showed you how to run a, a node for the subnet manually, but we are also working on scripts to run, but that's going to take a long time. So probably won't do that, but like we can run um, this subnet in a Docker and you specify like the subnet that you want to you want to, um, uh, the node for the subnet that you want to deploy and so on, and you're able to uh, have containerized all of these processes that have been running locally. And the, the idea is that we're trying to figure out like the right UX. So, um, as, I mean, once it's ready, it, we will really appreciate all the feedback that you can give us to make this as, like deploying subnets as seamless as possible. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alfonso. Great demos, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, looking forward to seeing everybody come back next month, um, which will be April 20th. But yeah, thank you guys and have a great day. Thanks for coming. Yeah.